we have we have not taught him poetry nor is it fitting for him this book is only a reminder and a clear quran chapter 36 verse 69 in the quran alif lam ra these are the verses of the book the clear book the clear quran chapter 15 verse number one Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I am your host, Taha Ghadur, and I'm here with another episode of Canada Today on Muslim Network TV, which you can also watch on Galaxy 19 uh, on cable, as well as on muslimnetwork.tv, as well as our social, social media platforms. In 2015, Canadian Muslims were very fortunate to get a fresh translation of the Quran. The name of this translation is the clear Quran. So what was so special about this translation? Well, we'll find out in a matter of few minutes uh, today with our special guest. There are many Canadian Muslims who are hesitant to let go of their classical English translations. May God reward all the amazing translators of the Quran like Yusuf Ali, uh, Marmaduke Pictal, uh, and others. Uh, but very soon, as the word got out about this new translation of the Quran, the clear Quran, a lot of people picked up a copy for themselves. And this translation began to receive uh, some good raving reviews and great publicity that it deserved. Even the youth uh, were reading it on their own and finding themselves drawn to the language as well as the, the format. It was very easy and accessible um, of this book of God, as best, of course, it can be translated in today's time. With me today is a Canadian Muslim leader who translated the clear Quran. He is not only an imam and an author, but also holds his doctorate in Islamic studies in English from Al-Azhar University in Cairo, Egypt. He lectured on Islam at Clemson University, USA, in the years 2009 and 2010. He also held the position of lecturer at Al-Azhar University for over a decade, since 2003. And he served as the Muslim chaplain at the Brock University and at the University of Toronto Mississauga campus. He is a member of Canadian Council of Imams, a Fulbright interfaith scholar, and an IRA Canada Outreach Specialist. Welcome to Canada Today uh, show, Dr. Mustafa Khattab. You are actually our first guest on this new series that we have launched um, that where we are featuring some great uh, people, movers and shakers in our Muslim community in Canada. So thank you very much for being here with us. Wa alaikum salam, jazakallah khair for having me. It's my pleasure. Alhamdulillah. Well, First of all, let me congratulate you on your amazing uh, new publication called the Illustrated Quran that you have published for children, which is, you know, sometimes the most one of the most neglected uh, segments of our community. So I'm very happy that you did that, and and from what I hear, yes, thank you for sharing that. Um, and it seems that you are so loved, and I haven't been able to even grab a, a copy for myself. So. Good for you, mashallah, and good for those who actually did receive a copy so far. Sakallah khair. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Well, let's start off by discussing uh, and learning a little bit about your journey. And so let me first ask you, is it safe for us to say that you are, or this is, the clear Quran is the first ever Canadian translation of the Quran? Um, and has there been anybody else before you who has done anything like this? Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wassalamu ala rasulullah. To the best of my knowledge, uh, T.B. TB, uh, TB Irving was the first Canadian to translate the Quran. Uh, he did the translation actually when he was in Iowa, I believe in the 1980s. Uh, mm -hmm. So he didn't actually do it in Canada, and he called it the first American translation of the Quran. Uh, I know that uh, Ustaz Ayub Hamid, who is an, a local imam in Mississauga, has also been working on his uh, uh, translation. But I believe that the clear Quran is the first one that was fully completed and published in the history of Canada. It's, 
it's in use uh, since 2014. Excellent, oh, really. mashallah. This is beautiful, and this is this is what makes it a, definitely a pioneering effort and definitely historic effort. And may Allah Subhanahu wa Taala accept this uh, beautiful uh, contribution that you've made and historic contribution to to the Canadian Muslim presence as well as Canadian Muslim literature. So that's that's a really really awesome um, achievement. Now. What about, uh, you know, when, I guess, when did you realize that you wanted to translate a Quran? Did you, you know, in your childhood ever dream that you wanted to translate a an English translation of the Quran? Um, how did this whole idea come up? Well, I have to tell you my story to, uh, to see the, the long journey. Mm. Uh, to start with, I didn't have the potential to even go to school when I was young. Uh, because most of the people in my village were farmers. We didn't have a school in the village. And um, none of my siblings uh, were six in total. None of them had been to school. And my parents didn't go to school. They couldn't read or write, uh, just like the majority of the people in the village. And eventually, alhamdulillah, my mom put a big fight to send me to school in another village. So I had to walk one hour one way and one hour the other way. Uh, but we, alhamdulillah, at the age of seven, I ended up going to Al-Azhar in another village. And by the age of 12, I completed the memorization of the Quran. When I finished high school, my dream was to become a journalist, a writer. Mm. And I got an advice from one of you know my friends. Uh, Subhanallah, he told me, you can be an imam, you can be a translator, and you can be a writer at the same time. So I changed my mind the last minute. So instead of going to the Arabic language to study uh, journalism, I ended up going to the faculty of uh, translation uh, and languages so I can study Islam in English. Uh, mm -hmm. Now the problem was because I started to study real English, English, English after the age of 20. So before 20, I didn't know any English. Uh, wow. We studied English as a subject in high school at Al-Azhar, mm -hmm. but of course we didn't have experts on teaching English. So anyone could teach English basically growing up in the 19, you know, 80s. Mm -hmm. So they taught us, for example, to say, and I always like to give these examples to, to show you how horrible my English was before the age of 20. Uh, so they taught us to say it's too much when you wanted to say stomach. You go to the mm. doctor and you say you have a problem my too much. He wouldn't know what you're talking about. My biryani is so deliquous. <laughs> if you say that Taha Gayur has extensive and extensive extensive ex appearance, ex appearance, experience, language for language. So basically, oh. the pronunciation was horrible, and you know it took me at least three years to fix my English. I wanted to. Uh, you know, to talk to one of the top students in the class. And uh, so maybe we can talk like five, 10 minutes in English every day, but he refused because my English was so bad. Mm. And that day, back in 1998, uh, 1998, yes, I, I made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at night after I prayed my Isha namaz and I said, Ya Allah, help me with my English. You created the heavens and the earth. So helping me with my English wouldn't be difficult for you. Alhamdulillah. And I promise, to, I promise you tonight, right here, right now, that I'm going to use it to teach people about Islam and about the Quran. Wow. So Alhamdulillah, for the next three years, I started to learn English. I read Shakespeare. And I had language exchange sessions with uh, some American Muslims. They taught me English and I taught them Arabic. And after three years, Alhamdulillah, I graduated. Not only the top of my class, but the entire English department. Uh, within a few months, I was appointed as a professor to teach Islamic studies in English at Al-Azhar. And I ended up getting my bachelor's in English, my master's in English, my PhD in English, alhamdulillah. And Beautiful. since 2007, um, I've been in North America, the U.S. and Canada teaching people about Islam and the Quran. And I've helped hundreds of people, you know, come to Islam and, and take shahada, alhamdulillah. Wow, this is a powerful story. I mean, you know, those of us who make excuses for not learning Arabic uh, because, you know, it's too hard or, you know, it's not my language or, you know, it doesn't come out right or all those things. I have accent problem. I can never pronounce ha or bad or whatever properly. Well, here is a, a very powerful story 
other way around where you know a person who has the arabic language who went through all this trouble uh, you know of learning the english language for a purpose which is amazing and that really shows you the the power of intention power of dua and asking god um, for for help sincerely and really sticking to it so this is this is an amazing story well thanks for sharing that background so at some point, so at what point did you realize that you know what now is time for me to translate the Quran all of a sudden did you have a dream one night uh, you translating the Quran now from you know Arabic to perfect English or did you see some problems out there which made you maybe you know a little upset with what is out there or was there a turning point in your life that made you do that? Yeah, so as I said, I joined the Faculty of Languages and Translation at Al-Azhar back in 1997-98. And I studied translation, I studied Quranic translations and tafsir, and I was familiar with uh, some of the issues and mistakes in uh, translation. Mm -hmm. uh, so a little bit of background here. I realized that for over 1,300 years, the Quran was never translated into English by a Muslim. Hmm. So for over 1300 years, the Quran was always translated into English and other European languages by European missionaries and or Orientalists. And most of them were not done for good reasons. Um, so basically, uh, you know, some of those translations were later copied by some Muslims who started to translate the Quran, but they were not qualified. And this explains why you still see some words in translation like jihad, like uh, holy war, infidels. We don't have these words in the Arabic, right? Uh, so basically, many of the people who translated the Quran, uh, especially from a non-Arab background, they didn't have a good intention to translate. I'm talking about, you know, historically. Mm -hmm. Then, in the first half of the 20th century, some Muslims, especially from the Indian uh, subcontinent, they started to translate the Quran, but some of them, they didn't have the right aqidah, the right you know, understanding of Islam. Some of them were not experts in translation. Uh, so for you to be qualified to translate, you have to have some training in Arabic, in English, translation, ulum al-Quran, Quranic sciences, uh, asbab al-nuzul, the reasons why certain passages were revealed, and so on and so forth. It, it's, it's a big field. Mm -hmm. So when I was giving out copies of the Quran in the U.S. and when I came to Canada, since 2007, I used to give out the copies, but as we say uh, in English, with a pinch of salt, because I am a native speaker of Arabic. I'm, I'm an expert in translation, but this is not what the Arabic says. And I said, something has to be done. And until one day in 2013, the summer of 2013, I was visiting Toronto. I was a guest imam at the masjid on, uh, on Dundas. Uh, Mac. So subhanAllah, that day I, I took a bus ride and the bus uh, driver was not Muslim. And he said, you know, Muslims are good people, but Islam sucks. Because it was the day of Juma Friday. I had a nice dress, mashallah, like a sultan. <laughs> so he was able to, uh, to figure out that I was Muslim. So I said, okay, what, you know, thanks for the compliment about Muslims, that they're good people. But why do you think Islam is bad? He says, because your book, the Quran, calls me an animal. And I said, subhanAllah, I'm Hafiz. I know the whole Quran in Arabic and in English, but it doesn't say this anywhere. He said, no. Uh, chapter 8, verse 55. Inna sharra dawab inda Allahi ladhina kafru. And I told him that the word dawab or dabba that you are referring to does not necessarily mean an animal. In Arabic, it's explained in another verse in the Quran, chapter 24, Surah An-Nur, verse 45. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he created every dabba, this word, from water, some of them slither on their bellies. They don't have any feet. Some walk on two feet like humans, and some walk on four, and Allah creates whatever He wills. So I said, it's a very general term. It's not referring to you. And if you read it in context, it's talking about the pagans of Mecca who violated all the peace agreements they had with the Prophet ﷺ. And if you read the verse before and the verse after, it becomes very clear. The verse is basically twisted. It's taken out of context to make Islam look bad. But I later realized that most uh, translations either use animal or beast, which is even worse. So I said, you know, tonight I'm going to start translating the Quran. So it took me about a year to finish the actual translation. So it was done 
2014. It took us some time to revise the new editions, but the translation was used uh, uh, is in was in use uh, back in 2014. Alhamdulillah. Mm. And every time there is a new edition, I do some revisions uh, to to refine the work. Alhamdulillah. Interesting. Amazing. So, um, what what was I guess a more distinguishing feature, or what were some of the distinguishing features uh, when it comes to the the clear Quran that you have produced uh, as compared to all the other translations that are out there? So I can see that you know your the background and 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 why you decided to actually which what, what was the impetus for you, but. What, what what were some of the things that you thought that really need to be done differently this time around? Okay, so uh, we uh, I need to make it very clear that uh, no translation in English or any other translation for that uh, matter or any other language will replace the Arabic Quran. The Quran is so powerful, it's perfect, it's the word of Allah. Uh, and I always say that the clear Quran is not perfect, it is just awesome, you know? Hmm. So only the Arabic is perfect. Uh, number two, the reason why I think the clear Quran is a good translation because we stand on the backs of giants uh, mm -hmm. like Yusuf Ali, Pickthal, and there are so many amazing uh, translations out there, but there's always something that is missing. Um, I'm going to give you five points or measuring sticks to decide mm -hmm. whether a translation is good or not. Okay. Uh, so you have Abdul Halim from Oxford. It's a good translation. You have Ahmad Zaki Hamad from Al-Azhar, Egypt. It's an, a good translation. And there are some other good ones. So basically, I studied most of those existing translations, about 120 of them in the English language. Most of them were done by uh, Muslims. Um, so the, the five measuring sticks. Number one, whether or not the translator is qualified. In many cases, the Quran was translated by people who were not qualified in the first place to translate the Quran. And subhanAllah, every one of them uh, says that I have produced the finest translation of the Quran, even if they are the least qualified to translate. Uh, and every time I see someone saying that they have produced the best translation of the Quran, and I say, dude, everyone says they make the best biryani. <laughs> but they can't all be true. Uh, so... Is the translator qualified? This is number one. And subhanAllah, it's very interesting, and I have never seen this in any other faith community, that someone who is not qualified, someone who is an accountant, someone who is a plumber, would come and translate a, a holy book, and people in that community will accept this book as reliable, as authentic, and they are going to use it uh, uh, to connect with God. This can never happen in the Jewish community. It can never happen in the Christian community. It only happens in the Muslim community. So mm -hmm. many of the existing English translations of the Quran were done by people who were not qualified. There are some uh, who were very qualified, uh, Abdul Halim, Ahmad Zaki Hamad, and some others, but many are not really qualified. And as I said, you have to be qualified in translation. You have to have training in the Arabic language, in English, in Ulum al-Quran, and as Babun Nuzul and so on and so forth. And the problem is when someone is not qualified, they just copy earlier translations when they are frustrated. Mm. And yes. the, the example that I always give, in Surah Anbiya, it says that Yunus السلام, when he's left, he left his, his town and he was very angry, he thought that Allah would have no power over him. Mm. If you ask a little kid, do you think that Yunus, a prophet, would think that Allah has no power over him? He would say no. The, the word actually means he thought that Allah would not restrain him. Qadar ala is very common in the Quran. Yes, yes, one of the meanings to have power, but the meaning here is he thought that Allah would not restrain him. It's, mm. it's used in the Quran in many places. Allah gives abundant or limited restrained risk to whoever he wills. Mm. And Allah actually restrained him. He put him in a tight place in the belly of the whale. Anyway, mm. So, you know, you'll find a lot of, you know, mistranslations, you'll find a lot of contradictions. Uh, and when we gave out those free Qurans out in Young and Dundas, and, you know, some of them will come back and say, well, there's a mistake here, there's a contradiction here. And I would say, this is not the word of Allah. This is a translation, basically, is a tafsir. It's a human effort to translate mm -hmm. the divine. And this is true for any translation. 
Mm -hmm. Quran, no other translation is perfect. So number one, whether or not the translator is qualified. Mm. And number two, uh, accuracy, based on the understanding of the Arabic, the source language. Clarity, based on how you translate into English and whether or not the text is accessible in the target language. And we need to stop using verily beneficent and all this stuff, even in kids' translations. This is nonsense. Nobody's using these words anymore. But subhanAllah, this is something that we got from Arab translators of the Quran. They think that the more complicated, archaic a translation is, like the King James Bible translation, they Bowing show the divinity and sacredness, holiness of the translation, which is not true. Because Allah says, وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلذِّكْرِ We made the Quran easy. Why do you mm. make it so difficult, dude? <laughs> Keep, make it easy. So, qualified or not, accuracy, clarity, eloquence, does it reflect the beauty and the power of the Arabi? And number five, which is ignored by almost everyone who translated the Quran, 99% of, of them, the flow. It has to be fluid. Uh, so listen to this. الشمس والقمر وحزبان والنجم والشجر ويسردان والسماء رفعا ووضع الميزان In Arabic, in Surah Rahman, the sun and the moon travel with precision. The trees and the stars bow down in submission. As for the sky, he raised it high and set up the, 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 the balance of justice. Something like this. So I tried to reflect the beauty of the Arabic. So translations like Abdul Halim and Ahmad Zaki Hamad, uh, is it accurate? Yes. Is the translator qualified? Yes. Flow, not as good. I, I would give flow 50%. Uh, eloquence that is reflect the beauty and the eloquence of, of, of Arabi. Ahmad Zaki Hamad is over translated. Uh, Abdul Halim is under translated when it comes to reflecting the beauty and the power of, mm. of Arabi. But they are still some of the finest uh, translations out there. Wallahu mm. Very interesting. Thanks for sharing the, these, uh, I guess, measuring sticks and sort of criteria that you used. Um, for making this uh, the clear Quran more distinct, which is which is really interesting to actually hear. Um, let me ask you this: Did you always, you know, see yourself as an imam in the community, uh, or did you see yourself more as a person who would do dawah or tr translate Quran or do other things? Because these are two different roles, and um, and it's amazing that you know people like you are able to actually balance both. You are a local imam in the community um, and, and at the same time you are an author and you do dawah. So how how do you first of all balance that? And, um, and, and secondly, is there a particular role you love more? Well, as an imam and uh, leading a jama'ah here like the Anatolia Islamic Center, which is a leading community like Isna, like... Uh, uh, Mac and um, you know other uh, major masajid in in the area. Uh, so basically, uh, I have to reach out to Muslims in the community as well as the interfaith community and the non-Muslim community when I do street dawah. Mm -hmm. So I have to be able to reach out and explain Islam and explain the Quran. So and I have seen the struggle in the Muslim community as well as the non-Muslim community when it comes to the Quran, the old English complicated translations. And I remember, Wallahi, in the U.S., back in 2008, 2009, I gave a translation of the Qur'an, Yusuf Ali, the one from 1934, to a guy who was a college graduate. He's a native English speaker. He's an American. And I gave him Yusuf Ali, and he called me a few days later, and he said, dude, I, I, there, there are some things here that I can't understand, so can you give me a better translation? Mm -hmm. So I had to give him another translation that was in modern English, but I knew that the guy who translated it was an accountant. So he had no training whatsoever in translation or Islamic studies. So it was filled with mistakes. And he actually copied, you know, most of his translation from Yusuf Ali anyway, but in modern English. So, uh, you know, Islam has to be accessible to Muslims and non-Muslims because we know that the Quran is for everyone. Dhikra lil alamin. It's a reminder to the whole world. So it has to be acceptable accessible both to Muslims and non-Muslims. And this is why, uh, subhanAllah, when I started doing the translation, I put together a big team. Uh, and if you can go to the acknowledgements, uh, mm -hmm. we have more than 100 people who were involved in the making of this book. If you go to the acknowledgements here, you can mm -hmm. see 
big list of imams and scholars and ulama and regular people. And so the people who are helping you, I mean, I'm wondering, uh, were they people you knew? Were they people from, you know, in Egypt or in Toronto or in Canada? Or were they from all parts of the world? I mean, how did you access so many people who were able to help you and that you acknowledged? Well, Alhamdulillah, I have many connections in different countries. In Egypt, I know colleagues, friends from Al-Azhar who, mm -hmm. who are very specialized in, in Dawah and Islamic studies. I know imams, editors, mm -hmm. local people. So I put together a big team from different countries, but it, it was mostly from St. Catharines in the Niagara region because this is uh, where I was when I was mm -hmm. doing the translation. So uh, we had... Uh, Muslims in the team. We had non-Muslims in the team. We have three non-Muslims and two of them actually took Shahada when we finished the translation. Alhamdulillah. We had high school students. We have people who, you know, like cab drivers. We had teachers. We had housewives. Everybody was involved because the Quran is for everyone. Mm. And this is why I was getting feedback from everyone. And subhanAllah, one unique feature is we revised the translation at least twice, uh, reading the, the translation. We had our chief editor, Abu Isa Webb, reading mm -hmm. the translation out loud. And we had a room full of people, Muslims, non-Muslims, old, young, men, women. Mm -hmm. And to see the flow, and someone would say, this is not clear, clarify. It's, it's awkward the way it sounds. And put a footnote, do this, do that. Mm -hmm. and, and subhanAllah, with the subtitles, with the sections, I think it made it very clear. And, you know, what the verses are talking about when you're reading, when you're memorizing. And also it makes it difficult for Islamophobes to take things out of context. Because once mm. you have the title, once you put the background in the footnotes, and you know it's part of the section, you can't just take a verse out of context and twist it to make Islam look bad. You have to I be thought that was the, I was. I thought that was the, probably one of the best features of this new translation, this translation that you brought uh, for it, because um, that's what I think what made it really stand out in terms of not only its flow, but its accessibility um, be, uh, and, and, and us being able to sort of segment the Quran. Why don't you take a moment, Imam Mustafa, help our readers who may not be necessarily too familiar with the Quran, help them understand why this segmentation that you did is so critical. Um, you know, if you have a chapter in a book, you don't need necessarily subtitles and, and subheadings. Um, why was this a unique and a very much needed uh, feature that you actually introduced, which was amazing? Okay, so if you think about a chapter like Surah Al-Kahf, chapter 18, it was revealed to the Prophet Wasallam, I believe, in one shot, like as, as a whole, just like Surah Ma'ida, for example. Mm. So you are talking about 10, 15 pages of English. And when you read it, it sounds like one paragraph, a 15 page paragraph. Mm -hmm. And of course, a surah like Surah Al-Kahf, it has four main stories and it has subsections. So I had to divide the stories and put titles to make it easy for people to understand. And I will give you another example. When I was very young, when I was memorizing the Quran, Memorizing Surah Yusuf was a piece of cake. Just one mm. story, it's easy. Surah Kahf, mm. four stories, Alhamdulillah, very easy. Surah Kahf was so, Surah Al Nahl, Surah uh, 16 was so difficult. And the reason why, because every three, two, three verses, they talk about something completely different. Mm. So two, three verses call, talk about the bees and honey. Two, three verses talk about, you know, the alternation of day and night. Another verse talks about revelations from Allah. I created you. I gave you spouses. And I said, what does this have to do with like, this is so confusing. Then subhanAllah, when I read the tafsir, I realized that this surah is called Surah Al-Ni'am, the surah of the blessings. Every two, three verses talk about different a different blessing. And this is why when I did the subdivision, I put 21 blessings in the surah. So when someone reads the translation, they, they see that there is a theme running through the chapter which is the theme of the blessings. And there are 21 of them in the chapter. So I gave them numbers. Favor number one or blessing number one, this. Blessing number two, this. Two, three, four, all the way to 21. So one, someone reads the translation, they know that 
the the surah is very coherent it has a theme running through it mm. yeah. amazing so does that mean the quran is inherently um i guess uh, random or, or disorganized or does that mean that we as people whether scholars even lay people who are reading the quran are not doing their effort to pick up the 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 underlying themes the um, the sort of the macro view of the surah the the unity of the message um and and then really the 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 gems that we need to be picking up on and is there a reason why you think that and of course only allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only allah god knows why that is the case why was not every surah already divided in 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 some sort of sub chapters or sub themes we know that the uh, certain passages of the Quran came at certain times to answer certain questions or to respond to a certain situation. And the Prophet Sallallahu at the direction of Jibreel Alayhi Salam, he would put the passage inside the chapter in this particular order. Uh, so as I clarified in the clear Quran, in the introduction, that all the surahs are interconnected. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll give you a couple of examples. The beginning of the chapter and the ending of the chapter are connected. So, for example, at the beginning of Surah uh, Mu'minun, Surah uh, 23, mm -hmm. but al Allah gives the qualities of the believers who will succeed. At the end of the chapter, Allah says, "Innahu la yuflihul kafirun." Those who deny the truth will never succeed. The first couple of pages in Surah 4, Surah An-Nisa, talk about inheritance. Then 25 pages later, the last verse of the chapter talks about inheritance. So Allah mm -hmm. subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us of the initial topic uh, of the chapter. The, even the ending of one chapter and the next one talk about the same thing. So Suratul, uh, Suratul Hajj, for example, mm -hmm. talks about salah, irka'u, isjudu, make rugur, sujood. Then the next verse, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ It talks about salah and, and so on and so forth. The last verse of Surah Al-Waqi'ah, فَسَبِّحْ بِسْمِ رَبِّكَ الْعَظِيمِ Say Subhan Rabbiya Al-Azim. Then Surah Hadid, the next one, سَبَّحَ لِلَّهِ It talks about tasbih. This is very common in the Quran. And subhanAllah, even the, the wording, like Surah Al-Tur وَإِدِبَارَ النُّجُومِ When the stars uh, set, Surah Al Najm wa Najmi Ida Hawa. The, the next verse, when the stars set. So mm. it's very interconnected, subhanAllah. So we need to understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He revealed the Quran, because in our limited understanding of time and space, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not limited by time and space, we see past, we see present, and we see future. Like your dad met your mom. Back in 1960s or 70s, they got married, they had you, then you grew up, you got married, you had kids. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't see it this way. He sees it as a whole. He sees the whole picture. We as human beings, we see only a small pixel. So mm -hmm. this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is moving in time and, and space. When in the Quran, he talks about Yamul Qiyamah, for example, 98% of the time Allah talks about judgment day in the past. It's always in the past. Mm. Why? Because Allah doesn't have past, present, and future. And also it's a rhetorical device to tell you it is sure to happen. It is as if it already happened. It's in the past. Mm. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we see different topics and different themes in the Quran. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees one theme, which is your relationship with Allah and your relationship with people. Your relationship with the creator and your relationship with the creation and every single verse in the quran uh, uh focuses on one or three themes the doctrine or the law your relationship with allah and the people number two stories number three the unseen any verse in the quran will fall under one of these three topics and i made this very clear in the table of context uh contents uh, when you start the uh, table here you can see the three themes and i put symbols Mm. And before you can even read the chapter, you know which of the three themes it actually covers. So if you see chapter 2 of Baqarah, it talks about the three themes. Surah Yusuf 12 talks only about one theme because it's it's actually a story. So it makes it super easy for you. 
That's so, amazing. In in other words, you know, most people are not going to read the entire Quran anyway, Muslims or non-Muslim. They read some in Salah, in the case of Muslims. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you, whatever you read in the Quran, in whatever surah you read, you will come across this common denominator, have faith in Allah, and be a good person. This is the common message wherever you read in any page, in any ayah in the Quran. Have faith in God, be a good guy. Hmm. This is what well, the thank Quran you so much about. for sharing these analogies. I think this is really good. Coming back to your story and your journey to the translation uh, of this uh, of this beautiful uh, production that you have worked on, all this, all, and it's amazing to see how how much collaboration and teamwork was involved, which is amazing. Um, I know uh, th that there are some good number of scholars who have endorsed your work. Who are some of these scholars, and um, and why is it so significant uh, for you to have these kinds of endorsements, which is definitely very impressive? Well, as a new translation, uh, people are always you know suspicious of new books and new mm -hmm. works. So you have to show them that the ulama and the scholars and the people are actually in the field, the insiders, not not the outsiders. The insiders, they have confidence in this book. So we have names like Sheikh Omar Suleiman, Sheikh Suhaib Webb, Yasser Qadi. It has been endorsed by and approved by Al-Azhar in Egypt, the Canadian Council of Imams, and uh, many other scholars, alhamdulillah. And even the Quran for Kids, we have here some of the uh, well-known scholars in the community. You see mm. the presence of the Canadian Council of Imams, Sheikh Ala Al Sayyid, and, and uh, many others here. And, and this is very important for people to have confidence in the, in the book. She see mm -hmm. Sheikh Hamid Salimi and uh, Sheikh Hussam Ilal from Isna. So th this is very important. Like these imams and du'at and scholars, they are in the field. And some of them, alhamdulillah, like Sheikh uh, Suhaib Webb uh, in, in his uh, organization, Swiss, he started mm -hmm. officially, uh, he adopted the Click Quran as his official translation of his organization. And many imams like Sheikh Hussam Hilal and uh, and many others uh, through uh, North America, they use the translation in their in their classes. Alhamdulillah. Amazing. When you translated this book, uh, this the, the, uh, translated, of course, the, the the clear Quran. What were some, uh, you know, were there any? Uh, was it, I won't say backlash, but was there any criticism? Were was there any resistance, whether from Muslims or non-Muslims? Um, and I mean, this goes for not only just the clear Quran, of course, you refer the actual translation of the Quran, but also the illustrated Quran, which yes. is sort of the next level. Were there any objections to using illustrations, for instance? Uh, so, what, how, what were some of the things you heard, and how did you overcome? Well, no, number one, when I first started, I I had a discussion with a colleague of mine. And he said, he told me that there are more than 120 translations in English. Why does the world need a new translation? Yep. And I said, if I'm not going to make a new contribution, I'm not going to translate the Quran. Mm -hmm. So inshallah, this one will be unique. I'm going to benefit from all the amazing translations before, but I will make the translation more accessible, more eloquent. I'm going to benefit and learn from the big uh, translators like Yusuf Ali and Pickthol and Zaki Hamad and Abdul Halim and many others. But I'm going to rely heavily on tafsir, Qurtubi, Tabari, Ibn Kathir. I'm going to reflect the beauty uh, of uh, the Arabi uh, tafs in tafsir. And I'm going to put some backgrounds and historical stories so people know what the verses uh, actually uh, talk about. Some resistance from some imams uh, who think, yes, you studied it at Al-Azhar, uh, you have to be uh, Ash'ari and Matt Rudi, and this is not Ahlul Sunnah. Dude, what are you talking about? These are among Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, you know? And number two, uh, just a small analogy, I'm not saying anything. I also studied Judaism, I studied Hinduism, I studied, I studied Qadianism. Does, it, does this affect or impact my translation of the Quran? The answer is no. I go back to the original sources, Ibn Kathir, Tabari, Qurtubi, the great scholars uh, of the Quran. And also, people who were so much attached to Yusuf Ali, Verily, Thou, and all mm. that stuff, they would question the translation of certain words because they are so much used to all translations. Mm. And they said, this is the translation, like Noble Quran by King Fahd Complex or... 
Sahih International. And I say, dude, this is, I'm a native speaker of Arabi. I study translation, all these sciences to be able to translate the Quran. I studied literally for over 35 years, 35 years to be able to translate. And I'm not saying I'm the best who ever translated the Quran. I learned from others, alhamdulillah. But this is more accessible and I believe it's more accurate than many other existing uh, translations. So you shouldn't mm -hmm. just, re re you know, reject the translation because it's new. Mm -hmm. You have to look at the five things, the measuring sticks that I, I looked about, I, I talked about before you reject the new translation. And I tell people the litmus test, the rule of thumb, get your best translation, the translation that you love so much, and get a copy of the Clear Quran, and, or you can go to our website, theclearquran.org, and download the free app and compare the translations and see for mm -hmm. yourself right otherwise you wouldn't you wouldn't see the difference yes. you have to read both and read for yourself very interesting were there any you know I, was there anything that you felt changed in your life after you did this translation was there something that you felt you know what after you accomplish this feat uh was there anything that changed that was that you thought you know what was a fruit of this labor that you actually produced? Well, uh, the, the the lesson that I always like to share, especially with uh, young generation, if I was able to learn English after the age of twenty, and if I was able to translate the Quran, and Alhamdulillah, this is a decent uh, translation that made the Quran accessible to millions of people throughout the world, you can basically do anything. You can learn Urdu, you can learn Arabic, you can learn Turkish, any language. If you want to learn coding, if you want to learn artificial intelligence, typing, anything you can learn, once you put your trust in Allah, you have the good intention and, and you work hard for it. And I, I, I you know, I have to, to share this story with you, just a few seconds, inshallah. When I read Surah Ghafir, Mm. After working for almost a year, day and night, believe me, I was working like 17, 18 hours a day. And I was working full-time imam. I had to take care of my family and my community. So I was pulling my hair out, especially when the, you know, Arabic, the Arabic is so powerful. It's a very rich language and English is so limited. And subhanAllah, I remember those nights I was drinking Earl Grey, Earl Grey tea from Tim Hortons and the dates, and I was listening to Sheikh Mustafa Ismail. I'm talking about thousands of hours. And I was breaking my head over some of those words because I either couldn't find an equivalent in, uh, mm. equivalent in, uh, in English or something that doesn't even exist in English like vihar and some other words. And even the existing ones like prayers and charity, they have different meanings in Arabic. And, and subhanAllah, uh, you know, when I read Surah Ghafir, I was worn out. I was so tired. And I said, you know, I think I need to relax a bit. And, and the reason why I was doing it every single day, whether I was sick, whether I was traveling, I was attending the RIS, our Eid day, I had to do a page, two, two sites every single day, no matter what, as they say, wow. come hell or high water. Uh, so I said, maybe I need to re relax here. Then I reminded myself of a story of a man who died before Islam. His name was Antara ibn Shaddad, a very famous uh, personality in pre-Islamic history. He was a hero. He was a slave. He gained his freedom. They had a silly competition before Islam because they didn't have Disney Plus. They didn't have mm -hmm. Netflix. So they didn't know how to spend their time before Islam. Because once they started to pray five times a day, Taraweeh, Qiyam, Alhamdulillah, they got busy. So they used to have this silly competition. So let's say I'm Antara and I have the competition with Taha Gayur. So the way they did it, I put my finger in your mouth. You put your finger in my mouth and we start to bite. And wow. Antara always won. He was asked why. He said, because as soon as the other guy, he started to bite, I felt like I wanted to scream. But I keep telling myself, Wait another second. Wait another second. He's going to scream first. And this is why I always won. So I told mm -hmm. myself I shouldn't give up. I should continue. I'm almost done, inshallah. I'm almost there. Wait another second. Wait another second. You can do it with the help of Allah. And I did it. And alhamdulillah, now I said, if I was able to translate the entire Quran, maybe I can do one for kids, 
-hmm. And once this is done, I did a, an illustrious, uh, illustrated story for kids. It's called Shukran, the Grateful Young Man, to teach our kids who are born and raised in North America to appreciate their parents. And alhamdulillah, by the end of this year, I'm going to release Qamus al-Quran, the Quran Dictionary, which it, it will make it super easy for the majority of Muslims, 85% of Muslims who don't speak wow. any Arabic, to read and understand the Quran on their own in a matter of a few months. Hmm. How many words are you expecting uh, to be part of this uh, dictionary? Well, I've been working on this since 2017. Uh, it should mm -hmm. be out, hopefully, inshallah, by the end of this year. It's mm -hmm. illustrated with images. Alhamdulillah, it's so logical in the way it is set up. And it's very easy, super easy, inshallah. Mm -hmm. You can study for four, four or five months or at your pace. And eventually you will understand everything in the Quran on your own. You don't need the clear Quran anymore. That's awesome. So how many words are you expecting in there to be? How many entries? Uh, entries, 2087. Wow, that's really cool. So Very it's finished. Cool. Now we're in the phase of revising and styling and formatting. In just a few months, it should be out, inshallah. It's really exciting. Ma Mashallah, you've uh, you know turned into a sort of a publishing house uh, of your own. Uh, you know, the way you're turning out new translations, new commentaries, new uh, illustrations. This is phenomenal. Um, before I, we end, yes. I wanted to say that the reason I'm doing this, well, like, I'm not doing it for fame or or, or no, no. gain. The uh, Dawah edition of the Clear Quran, almost uh, one million copies are given out free to non-Muslims in North America, the US and Canada, about close to one million every year. I don't charge wow. anything. It's given fi sabilillah for free. So when I stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on judgment day, I will say, well, I have tried to do something for Islam and to teach humanity about, about this religion. Mm. So please, through the shafa of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, give me the natul for those. Ameen, ameen, ameen. A uh, few people have been asking uh, this question in comments. Um, online, how can they get a copy? Uh, how can they purchase one? How can they grab one um, for whether it's a clear Quran or illustrated Quran? Please share that with us. Well, you can go to our website. We have everything in one place. Thatclearquran.org. Thatclearquran.org. You have it on the screen. Thatclearquran.org. Yeah, sure that. yeah. You have the app. You have the different versions. You have the Arabi, um, the King Fahd Arabi. You have the Indo-Pakistani uh, uh, script, the Majid script, the mm -hmm. uh, co copy with the 13 lines with the mm -hmm. clear Quran. You have the clear Quran for kids. You have the Shukran story. Everything is in one place, inshallah. Yep. So go to great. the clearquran.org and everything is there. Awesome. That's great. Um, we will uh, be ending with just asking you one last question, and that is share with us three life lessons. And I think you did already uh, a couple. But to short, you know, briefly as we end, what are three top life lessons you learned through your journey to this translation of the Quran? Well, number one, don't let anybody make you feel like you're nobody. If someone tells you you can't learn English, your English is so bad, you can't translate the Quran, there's no need, don't listen to them. Believe in yourself, and inshallah, with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you can achieve your dreams. Uh, number two, you need to think big and, and aim high. Uh, even in, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu is teaching us in uh, Bukhari, when you ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala for Jannah, don't ask for the basement, ask mm. for the Firdaus Al-A'la. So always think big and aim high. And number three, ask yourself, what is your legacy? After we leave this world, what is your legacy? Something good that benefits humanity, uh, something that will make Islam accessible to people and so on and so forth. Uh, so, uh, all of us, we need to work on a legacy. Your legacy could be something um, big like translating something, making Islam accessible to millions, or raising good Muslim kids, or doing your salah on time, holding the door for someone, smiling to someone. This can be your legacy. You never know which one of these will give you Jannah. So, so mm -hmm. these are some of the life lessons that I like to give to, especially to the young uh, generation. Islam is beautiful. The Quran is amazing. We have this treasure. We need to share it with humanity and, and make it accessible, inshallah. And may Allah reward Dawanet uh, and uh, Sound Vision for the great work, alhamdulillah. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mustafa Khattab. Uh, Jazakumullah khairan for 
coming out and really sharing your glimpses of, of your journey with us today and really inspiring us, actually. Um, and on this note, um, you know, we'd like to, inshallah, end. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks, uh, special thanks, of course, to our dear guest, the first uh, uh, Muslim change maker that we have featured today in our series at, uh, at the Canada Today Show. Uh, thank you, Sister Nergis Nakwi, who is our show producer, as well as a uh, shout out to Dawanet for being our marketing partner um, on this series. And thank you all for to all our wonderful viewers who have been watching us uh, for the past uh, few weeks and specifically this show. Um, and inshallah, we're going to be mo bringing more of movers and shakers and change makers to our shows in the days to come. Uh, once again, you're watching Canada Today on Muslim Network TV. And I'm your host, Taha Vuyur. And I look forward to seeing you again in a couple of days. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Peace Salaam. be with you. Assalamu alaikum.